Good morning, everybody. I hope you are keeping well. I hope you are keeping sane. Um, what I'm going to do is monologue for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes. And at the end of that, take any questions, assuming that uh, you're all still awake. Um, and the way I want to start, kind of by summary at the start, is to say that where we find ourselves in the current circumstances, where we find ourselves is believing that it is perfectly rational, perfectly rational to do nothing, or at least to do very little if we're not sure. You know, as the motto or piece of advice runs, when in doubt, do nothing. Yeah. And keeping that advice or motto at the forefront of our minds, uh, what I'd like to do, first of all, is to review with you the positioning uh, and the strategy uh, for Finsbury Growth and Income Trust. And I've got two general observations. The first is to reiterate that Finsbury Growth and Income Trust portfolio is very predominantly oriented towards big cap companies. Over 90% by value of the portfolio is invested in FTSE 100 companies or their equivalent. And by that, I mean, we have a two or three non-UK companies, but they are very substantive businesses themselves. Now, having said that, I, I do want to submit that some of the so-called big companies that we have within Finsbury's portfolio, some of the so-called big companies, we would still argue are actually are actually still small companies relative to their potential and relative to their warranted value. So for instance, uh, a FTSE 100 company like the London Stock Exchange, Relics, Burberry, Sage, all of these are businesses that we anticipate could be much, much bigger businesses, even though they're all still in the FTSE 100, much, much bigger businesses over the next, let's say, half decade. Now, also uh, 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 on this point, uh, I, I, I want to observe as well that of the just about 9% of Finsbury's portfolio that's not invested in FTSE 100 companies or their equivalent. So in other words, the roughly 9% of the portfolio that's invested in mid cap or smaller cap ideas, of that 9%, nearly 7% of that 9% is made up of companies with no debt, and net cash on their balance sheet. In other words, when we take some liquidity risk, look down the market capitalization spectrum for outstanding brands or franchises, nonetheless, we want to make sure that those businesses are exceptionally uh, conservatively financed and sound. Now, the second uh, observation I want to make about the strategic positioning of Finsbury's portfolio is this. The way that I analyze the portfolio structure, the way we think about the portfolio structure, is to split it across four thematic ideas, four industry or thematic buckets. And in order of size, those four buckets are as follows. Finsbury today has 42% of its portfolio by value 
invested in what I perhaps bullishly, perhaps bullishly, but invested in what I call digital winners. Now, I must admit there is a degree of latitude, perhaps, in the definition of what constitutes a digital winner. So, for instance, I've allowed myself to include within that 42 percent uh, at least one company that some investors might not regard as a digital business at all. And that's Manchester United, of which I'm going to say a little bit more later. It's also true that within that 42 percent, I'm also including the one and a bit percent that we still have invested in Pearson. And for sure, however else you describe Pearson, you certainly wouldn't necessarily describe it as a digital winner, at least not yet. I have to say, we watch the marked upsurge in um, uh, signups to Pearson's virtual schools business in 2020 with some interest. Okay, moving on, the next bucket is 34% of the portfolio is invested in beloved or trusted consumer brands, notably global consumer brands. Then we have 15.5% of the portfolio invested in luxury, premium or aspirational consumer brands. And here I must just note that I've cut myself some slack just to let you know, and I've included within that 15.5%, I've included 2% of our exposure to Diageo, which I've taken out of the 34% in beloved and trusted brands, but I've included 2% of that in premium and luxury because I want to highlight the 20% plus and growing proportion of Diageo's revenues that are in their reserve and premium brands. That is a wonderful collection of premium spirits brands. The growth of those premium brands is going to drive value for Diageo as far ahead as we can, as far ahead as we can see. So those three buckets combined make up 91.5% of Finsbury's portfolio. The remaining roughly 8.5% is invested in stock market proxies, and particularly it's invested in asset management companies with substantive and growing private wealth offerings. And that's largely, wholly, because we believe that the provision of private wealth services, that's, that's, a growth, that's a growth business. So just returning to my opening gambit, the reality is that that portfolio shape that I've just outlined to you, that really hasn't changed much during the course of 2020. And frankly, why, why should it? Um, each of those four segments we would submit, each of those four segments are winning industries, winning ideas, and we can't see any reason why they shouldn't continue to be winning ideas. Now, having said that, I do acknowledge, I do acknowledge that over time, I would both expect and hope that the digital winners bucket and the luxury and premium brands bucket will both grow proportionately uh, uh, as part of the uh, as part of the the total. And I would expect both of those two buckets to grow in part because I would expect the capital gains from those segments to lead 
Finsbury's NAV progression, but also, also because when we have the opportunity and when we can do so judiciously, we intend to continue to increase the exposure of the portfolio to both digital winners and luxury, uh, luxury branded companies. And in earnest of that proposal, could I just remind you that, in fact, during the tumult of 2020, um, we've been fortunate enough to uh, still issue new stock for Finsbury and the combination of new capital to deploy and wild, wild uh, stock market has enabled us to initiate two new holdings for the strategy uh, in 2020 to date. First new holding, and this fits the digital winners theme, first new holding is Experian. Uh, we've built now Experian up to just short of a 2% holding. There's more to do. But absolutely, we see Experian as evidently one of the UK's rare, and it's a shame that it's rare, <laughs> but one of the UK's rare, globally significant, multi-billion sterling market cap companies doing something smart with data and digital technology. For Experian to work from here as an investment, and obviously we, we believe it's going to, we need to see more R&D work being done by the company on smart algos, on ever more refined, uh, ever more refined analytics. The second new holding in 2020, I must say, I regard as, us as being very fortunate, very fortunate indeed, to have been given an opportunity earlier this year to initiate a holding in fever tree at a very, very depressed share price. Um, and obviously fever tree fits this premium luxury branded theme. And do you know what, for, for me, if I had to pinpoint the trigger, the trigger that convinced me uh, and my colleagues that we needed to have exposure to Fevertree's wonderful brand within our portfolio, that the trigger was seeing Diageo marketing materials, Diageo's marketing materials, where the company combines images of Johnny Walker Black Label with Fever, Fever Tree soda water. It was that kind of mutual uh, joint halo effect, if you like, you know, the, the premium spirits brand choosing to enhance its reputation by associating itself with a premium mixer and vice versa that persuaded us that Fever Tree's brand is, well, truly, truly valuable and, well, in our opinion, uh, a long, long way still to go. Okay, I, I, I'm going to move on now from the structure of the portfolio. Um, I find, in all candour, I have nothing to say about the macro outlook, um, largely because I haven't the faintest idea, of course. But contrarily, contrarily, I find I have a whole lot to say about the micro outlook, if I can make that contrast. I've got a whole lot of scuttlebutt to share with you. Uh, in other words, I've got a lot of, well, maybe more or less random, but a lot of more or less random facts or observations to make about the companies that we're invested in. These are all relatively recent facts, uh, facts that we think are at least intriguing, 
about the companies we're invested in. And maybe more than that, maybe they're encouraging. So with your patience, I'm going to share, uh, share some of these facts with you. So I have to say for me, uh, one of the best bits of recent good news, one of the best bits of recent good news was revealed at Relex's, Reed Elsevier's, nine month results, which came out two or three, two or three weeks ago. And with those results, Relex was able to update investors with these facts that submissions to Elsevier's subscription scientific journals, and of course Elsevier is the biggest division within Relex, submissions to Elsevier's subscription journals have accelerated markedly in 2020 and are up 25 percent on last year. In addition, submissions to Elsevier's open access journals, now that's a smaller part of Elsevier's business but growing quickly, submissions to Elsevier's open access journals have doubled year on year. Now I thought that was very good news and I thought it was very good news for two reasons. First of all, it demonstrates in a digital age, it demonstrates that scientists still believe that getting their work published on Elsevier, in Elsevier's journals, is the best way for their work to get recognition and to be widely read. That's reassuring for that franchise. Second, though, I would say, <laughs> I just found it reassuring, heartening to see that scientists around the globe are clearly redoubling their efforts to help humanity deal with all that's afflicting us. And of course, we wish the scientists well in their endeavours. Just as a by the by, uh, and I also think that this is illuminating, Relex also pointed out that uh, in the nine month numbers that driver miles in the United States, driver miles are now back to 90 percent of their pre COVID levels. It's showing you something about the resilience of the US economy, it's also very, very important for uh, Relex's most rapidly growing and value creating division, which is its insurance and risk analytics business. Moving on, Sage. Sage hosted a technology seminar. Uh, right at the end of September, a technology seminar for investors and analysts. And one of the statistics that emerged from that seminar is that this year, 25%, a quarter of all VAT invoices, a quarter of all VAT invoices in the UK have been processed on Sage Business Cloud. We thought that was a pretty impressive statistic. And it leads us to wonder whether Sage's transition towards being a fully fledged cloud software service provider, whether Sage's transition is being underestimated by other investors. Last week, last week, Hargreaves Lansdowne suffered an outage on its platform. As I'm sure you know, on the day of the Pfizer vaccine news, volumes, uh, volumes across the platforms went up 
tenfold within the space of a couple of hours and Hargreaves platform creaked, the capacity creaked. Um, and listen, I, I understand absolutely you can parse that event from two perspectives. Obviously, it's not good <laughs> when your customers can't transact. On the other hand, to us, it's it's part and parcel of something that we've been watching with this with this company. Think about this. In its financial year to June 2019, in its year to June 2019, Hargreaves received 1.7 million transactions on its platform delivered by a mobile device. Now, in its financial year to June 2020, that 1.7 million transactions by a mobile device had turned into 4.2 million transactions. In other words, an explosive growth of interaction between the platform and its customers via a digital device. That growth is driving overall revenue growth for Hargreaves Lansdowne. It's growing in double digits in 2020 yeah and there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of uk companies growing at double digits uh this year heineken heineken's having a tough year we own heineken and have done for many years in finsbury's portfolio of course you know, the bars, particularly in Europe, have shuttered again, sadly, for everybody. Um, and not surprisingly, at Heineken's third quarter results, again, a couple of weeks ago, not surprisingly, the company had to admit that organic volumes of its beverages, organic volumes of its beverages worldwide are down 8%. And actually, the fall in operating profits is much worse than an 8% fall because of the operating leverage within Heineken's business. Nonetheless, within that sorry tale, there was a fact that really made us sit up. And that is that the biggest and the most profitable brand that Heineken owns, the biggest and most profitable brand actually grew over the same period year on year. Now, you won't be surprised to hear that that biggest and most pro profitable brand is the eponymous Heineken brand itself. And volumes of Heineken, the brand, were up a percent, just one percent, uh, from the year before. Nonetheless, I have to say, we thought that that was a remarkable achievement for the Heineken brand. Um, that growth, very much driven by the incredible success of Heineken Zero, um, which the company says is the single most successful new product launch in Heineken's history. I have to tell you, it's being drunk by the crate load at train towers. Um, but the, the fact that Heineken, the brand, could grow at all in this recent, uh, this recent period to us is really encouraging. And, you know, no surprise, no surprise that on the Pfizer vaccine news, Heineken stock price up 20%, you know, <laughs> almost instantaneously. You know, you, you don't want to miss the eventual resumption of compounding growth in this wonderful, this wonderful company. Um, not surprisingly, uh, another business that's having a tough time in 2020 is Manchester United. Uh, Manchester United has just reported a quarterly loss. Now, I know I mentioned earlier that I had perhaps 
uh, controversially uh, chosen to include Manchester United in our digital winners bucket. The reason for that to us, evidently, the reason for that is because we absolutely expect the digital platform companies in the world, the digital platform companies in the world to continue bidding up the price and value of broadcast rights for sports. And if that's right, football, global football, will absolutely be the major beneficiary of that continuing inflation and escalation in the value of sports rights. While we're waiting, though, let me just share one statistic that Manchester United shared with investors at its most recent quarterly results, and that was this. Over the last 12 months, hits, digital hits to Manchester United's social media assets, digital hits were 1.1 billion. 1.1 billion individual hits to their site. That's up 24% over the last 12 months. There's absolutely no evidence that the world's fascination with this franchise and other leading sports franchises has waned at all. And in an increasingly digital planet, attention, any attention that can be brought to digital platforms is of increasing value. Now, listen, I could go on and on with these sorts of scuttlebutt examples, but I think the, the point is clear. I hope I've made my point clear. It's so crucial not to confuse a short term tactical set of problems that the world is facing at the moment, not to confuse that or let that mask true secular underlying progress from, uh, from companies. Okay, I, 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 I'm gonna conclude, uh, I'm gonna conclude this session with, I, I, I wanna talk about the distant past, uh, and also the, I suppose, the distant future, at least distant by the standards of the time horizons of most investors. Um, I want to talk a bit about Unilever. Uh, and I want to talk about Unilever partly because it's an important holding, but partly also because what I've got to say, I hope gives you some sort of perspective on the way that we think about the we think about the equity investment challenge so unilever um, unilever has a listing on the s p 500 it listed on the s p as long ago as 1964 now between 1964 and 1991, Unilever's share price went up a hundredfold. Yeah, it was a hundred bagger over that 27 year period. Not a bad advertisement for a steadily compounding business, admittedly or maybe even importantly, during a period of strongly rising inflation. Since 1991, Unilever's share price in sterling is up a further 12 fold. Uh, and I'm not including any reinvested dividends at all there. It's up 12 times in terms of its capital value. By contrast, the FT or share index has trebled, yeah? A 12 bagger compared to a three bagger for Unilever, that's showing you what a winning company can do for you. Over the last five years, Unilever's share price is up about 65%. 
for those of us laboring away in the UK stock market, and of course, that's what Finsbury does. For those of us laboring away in the UK stock market, let me give you the morose reminder that while Unilever's gone up 65% over the last five years, the FT All Share Index is up about one and a half percent. Just miserable stuff. But listen, there's an important reason to explain why Unilever has been such a strong share price over the last five years. And that's this. Unilever's biggest emerging market exposure is India. And Unilever takes its exposure or has its exposure to India via the medium of its near 70% shareholding in Hindustan Lever, which is India's biggest consumer goods business. Now, listen, over the last five years, Hindustan Lever's share price is up 270% in sterling terms, up 270%. And as a result, Unilever's stake in Hindustan Lever now represents, well, just short of 30% of Unilever's market capitalization. We would absolutely expect over the next five, over the next 10 years, Hindustan Lever to become an even bigger proportion of Unilever as the Indian economy gets wealthier. By the way, Hindustan Lever had its quarter three results two or three weeks ago. Do you know what Hindustan Lever's revenue growth was over the last quarter, year on year? Up 16%. Yeah, it's not only technology companies that are growing rapidly around the world in 2020. And I suppose my conclusion on Unilever is why would we think about selling? Why, why would we want to let go of this proven winning company when it's so evidently evident that there's still a lot of value creation to come? Now, Unilever, it's just a part of Finsbury's portfolio. It's an important part, but it's just a part of the portfolio. When I look across the rest of Finsbury's portfolio, there in our opinion, are a lot of other proven, incredible, winning businesses that we own. The London Stock Exchange is up 22 times since it listed. Sage is up 127 times since it listed. Schroeder's is up 14 times since it listed. Diageo is up 15 times since the late 1980s. Heineken is up 21 times since the late 1980s. Listen, it's very traditional. It's very simple, but it can be so powerful. This piece of advice, run your winners. That's what we're doing in 2020. Thanks for listening to me.